name is Sarah Overton. I'm the production manager for The Dream Unfinished, and I'm joined today by Ed Lee, who is the executive director and co-founder of The Dream Unfinished. And then in our yet unheard segment, which is our segment on lesser known masterworks by underrepresented composers, we'll be talking about plain chant for America. Uh, so plain chant might be a term that is new to some of you, uh, and plain chant music is actually a very old term. It comes from Renaissance music. So plain chant in music is uh, really liturgical music where religious texts are kind of sung to a single line. Um, so it's, it's really just telling one story in that single line, sort of free rhythm, so no real rhythmic meter uh, to go along to it. And what's so interesting uh, about this is that this plain chant for America may or may not really be kind of an example of a plain chant. I know Un has a lovely example of the plain chant for America. Can you share that with us, Un? Yeah, well, I think we should first actually hear that contrast of what a plain chant is, which I think this is actually one of those musical terms where people probably know what it is, but they just didn't know what to call it. So this is an example of a pretty classic plain chant. And we'll just hear like, a few seconds of it. So as Sarah was saying, um, what we just heard, I think people are familiar with vaguely, like it's sort of quoted musically a lot, right? And, and um, just to recap for that particular definition, what we just heard, it's uh, monophonic, meaning that it's all um, one melodic line. And then as we heard, like there aren't any instruments, right? There isn't like a piano accompaniment or an orchestra accompaniment. Um, Whereas, yes, this piece, Plain Chant for America, which we're featuring today, it's um, it actually exists in a few different forms, but definitely multiple voices and definitely lots of accompaniment. In fact, like a full orchestra <laughs> is accompanying it. So we'll be talking a little bit more about like where we, our hypothesis for like why the title refers to this, you know, kind of medieval era um, genre that we just sampled um, but then why that's being transposed to a piece that's obviously none of the things that we just heard. Yeah, I love that. And, and just to build on that too, what was interesting about the plain chant example is that it can be many voices singing one line as well. It doesn't have to be a singular voice singing one line. Um, but a lot, just like you said, and um, you know, this plain chant for America is very different from what we think of as plain chant. And I think, um, you know, the theory that we kind of came to uh, was that there, uh, the plain chant for America is really based on a piece of poetry uh, by Ka uh, Catherine Garrison Chapin Biddle. Um, and in this poem, there is a, uh, it's sort of like a call to action almost at the end. Um, and it's one line or, uh, it, or it's a, a few lines really that are in this text um, that have the singular summation of, of this, uh, of what she's trying to evoke through the poem. Um, and it reads saying, tell them again, say it America, say it again till it splits their ears. Thanks, Anne. Yep. Yeah. Freedom, till it splits their ears. Freedom is the salt in our blood and its bone shape. If freedom fails, we'll fight for more freedom. This is the land and these are the years. When freedom's a whisper above their ashes, an obsolete word cut on their graves, when the mind has yielded its last resistance and the last free flag is under the waves. Let them remember that here on the rest Western horizon, a star once acclaimed has not set, and the strength of a hope and the shape of a vision died for and sung for and fought for and worked for is living yet. Um, so, I mean, what a gorgeous, what a wonderful poem and, and wonderful text to take from, to make music from. You can already hear some of the music, but just the singular call to action, the singular vision 
um, of freedom and the fight for freedom really spoke to us, I think, in, uh, you know, kind of how plain chant worked in medieval times. I think it's such an interesting and beautiful piece. And like you said, uh, William Grant still was a prolific composer. It wasn't, he's best known for his Afro-American symphony, but I mean, he composed operas and symphonies and um, chamber music. It was really, really incredible. He was also the first uh, Black American to conduct a symphony in the United States. Um, so, you know, he's he's lived a very uh, interesting life to, um, you know, came up in Mississippi, went to uh, the New England Conservatory of Music, um, you know, just really was a, a wonderful composer, storied composer, um, and produced actually uh, a libretto with Langston Hughes in one of his operas. Um, so really just tied into the fabric of American music and American life. Um, so William Grant Still is, is absolutely wonderful and he's got the storied history of Langston Hughes writing his libretti. I mean, wild, just really wonderful stuff. So um, he gets connected with Catherine Garrison Chapin Biddle um, to, for this poem, this Blaine Chant for American poem. Um, and, and can you talk a little bit more about how that happened, how the poem happened and, and this connection was made? Yeah, so this was actually their second collaboration. Uh, their first was a piece that um, has been programmed more recently um, as well. Um, it's the title is And They Lynched Him on a Tree. Um, and so uh, uh, she has such a long name, so I'm going to call her Chapin Biddle. Um, so Chapin Biddle, she had created this poem, and then uh, William Grant still said it, and that, and, and it's this incredibly moving oratorio. We should actually do a feature on that sometime, Sarah. I think that would be a great yet unheard. Um, but so Plain Chant for America was another poem that she had written, and um, it's it, while I'm always sort of, I I, I don't necessarily think it's. Uh, salience always to mention, like, if a woman is married to a specific person. Um, I, I think in this particular instance, it is because she was married to Francis Spittle, who uh, served as a judge during the Nuremberg trials. And so when she started writing Plain Chant for America, it was actually pre-World War II, but ended up becoming this poem that was very much in response to, you know, this um, fight against fascism frankly, and, 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 and um, fighting for these sorts of ideals of democracy and freedom. Um, so it's just very, uh, in some ways, um, nationalistic poem, but, but I, not, well, it's not patriotic because it also sort of calls out like some of the problems that we have in America. Um, so it's an interesting poem to look at almost as like a time capsule moment, but then also like as a work in and of itself. And so um, in 1941, um, it, it was announced that this piece was going to be premiered and it was dedicated to Eleanor Roosevelt, um, who officially accepted the dedication on behalf of herself and, and her husband, FDR. So, you know, that's cool that like a composer would write something that like the first lady and and by extension the white house is saying like we are we are accepting this um and it was premiered by the new york philharmonic and it was performed at carnegie hall so you know not a small band and not a small hall by any means um and we have this little sort of a quote around um, more of the context from some, there were two New York Times articles that we could find in 1941 about this. So this is from Allen Downs, and he describes it as, Mrs. Chapin was inspired to write the poem of Plain Chant for America as a protest against fascism, rampant in many places in America today, and the gap, in her own words, between totalitarianism and the American democracy in which I believed. Um, and by all accounts, it was very well received. Um, it, Sarah and I were joking about this because we were able to look at the actual uh, New York Times article and on the same page there's this like I guess photo of Alvin Berg <laughs> because like 12 tones was like hot off the presses at that moment right <laughs> uh, but anyway going back to Plain Chant for America so um, yeah, frankly it, 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 it the it, Sarah correct me if I'm wrong but it said like the piece was like extremely well applauded. It was well received, but yeah. um, it was an article that was maybe this long, 
of which like this much was around Plain Chant for America. And then this much was about a bad Chopin orchestration. <laughs> and then like this much was about like a Brahms concerto or something like that. So it didn't really get much, it didn't make much of a splash, I guess, with the particular New York Times reviewer, although it was well received. Um, and then it's just interesting because, you know, we can't necessarily verify this, but I'm pretty sure that the, so the piece was premiered by the New York Phil in 1941. And then we performed it in 2015. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure it was not performed by an orchestra between those two performances. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not very popular as an, as an orchestral work. Um, in the last few years, there have actually been more recordings and performances of it as a choral work. So this is just a, a really quick aside, but William Grant still, even though he was as Sarah had mentioned, you know, all of these sorts of uh, credentials, right? Like first black American to conduct a symphony, first black American to have a work premiered by a major symphony, collaborated with Langston Hughes, you know, uh, w had been awarded like a Guggenheim fellowship, like all of these things. Um, but he was black and faced prejudice and often, um, what he would sometimes do is he would take a piece of music and then write it in multiple versions. And I, if I remember correctly, like sometimes that version would go to one publisher, but then another version would go to another publisher because like, number one, he was just trying to get his music out into the world. But then number two, it was also like, just to, I mean, you know, man's got to eat. <laughs> um, so plain chant for America, uh, the version that we performed is for solo, voice, and orchestra. It can also exist for chorus um, and orchestra. It can also exist, as I found in 2014-15, for solo, voice, and piano, and then also for chorus and piano. So there are actually now, I would say, three or four recordings on YouTube, which you can include in our links again, um, that are the choral versions. Um, but I'm not aware of other orchestral performances, at least recently. Um, and, you know, and this is unfortunate too, because frankly, as I said earlier, no one knew what we were doing. So we have a recording of our performance from 2015. It, it, the, the live performance was very well received, but the recording is not as forgiving <laughs> in terms of, you know, frankly, I'll be very honest, like the orchestra was a little bit under rehearsed and like, you know, we were, it was just this whole crazy thing. So if people are really curious and don't mind hearing a slightly out of tune orchestra, um, then we could absolutely send along our, our archival recording. If you're, if you have any interest in programming it yourself, you absolutely should. It's a marvelous work and you don't need 96 people on stage. We were just being crazy. Um, but yeah, I mean, so the version that we're streaming today is actually a version that we recorded that is in tune. Um, and it is with a uh, pianist, Che Gyohan, and bass baritone, Deshaun Burton from Roomful of Teeth. So we will just play a little version, a little bit of this, and then uh, we can welcome folks to check out the full eight minute work on their own. So let me go ahead and get that all. Yes, okay.
For as far as and 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 please by all means if folks want to watch the video and bump up our view count <laughs> <laughs> go for it we will also include that link but but again you know this is one recording that is on youtube and there are now these other choral recordings that people could also um check out if that is the mode in which they either want to listen to it or maybe even program it themselves yeah thank um, you Thank you for sharing that. And, um, and I mean, Deshaun Burton's voice, uh, you know, is just beautiful. Just what a golden instrument he has. And, and um, you know, the pianist is just so wonderful. So I'm, I'm glad that we got to hear a little bit of that. And I'm curious too, um, just wondering out loud if, if maybe the choral version is, is played a little more often because you can hear the text um, mm -hmm. as opposed to the orchestral version. So you know, just just the thought that I was having as you know, re-listening to this recording. Um, so very, very wonderful. And like you said, we'll be sure to post that link um, to the performance that we just saw, as well as where to purchase the sheet music, um, and you know where you might want to see some of these uh, reviews of the piece as well. Um, so I want to, uh, I think, close us out. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to click the like and subscribe button. Leave us a comment in the comment section. We read every single one of those comments. So please leave us a comment. We would appreciate it. Um, and hopefully you'll be around next week for our next episode. We can't wait to see you then. All right.